All this weekend, we are taking a look back at a case in review. The charges against Brian Koberger and the murder of the four Idaho college students. Taking a listen to some of the most compelling conversations and discussions that we've had thus far. Let's listen to another one. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. If you're touting that you're looking forward to being exonerated and the evidence doesn't look very good against you. Let's, for a moment, for the sake of this conversation, assume that we're talking about Brian Koberger and that he's guilty, okay? Obviously, innocent and brutal, proven guilty, but let's just assume guilt right now, okay? Siobhan Scott is joining us. Uh, She's a psychotherapist and author. Siobhan, can you provide some insight into what that might be going through someone's mind, like Brian Koberger? enabling them to say things like they're looking forward to being exonerated, at least through their attorneys. For the kind of person that we would anticipate being a a serial killer, which is the type of murder that we're looking at with Koberger, it is the, the same methodology of a serial killer. Whether or not he has killed other people, we don't know. But if he did, in fact, commit the Idaho college student murders, then he would in all likelihood have gone on to commit other murders. And so for that type of criminal, there's a big um, element of, look what I can do. I'm smarter than everyone else. I can fool everyone else. I can get away with things. And that's just a huge motivator for them. And so it doesn't surprise me that he would think he's going to beat the charge. And I I believe that Ted Bundy did the same thing, you know, Mm -hmm. with his being arrested, escaping, trying to serve as his own attorney. You know, there's just a theatrical element to this and this theme of I'm smarter than everyone else. And so I'm going to get out of it. And, you know, you, you might look at it objectively and say that's absurd, but obviously people can have very different ways of thinking. Very much so. And let's talk about that. I mean, his own psychological state. I mean, what is going on there? Does someone like that truly believe that they are innocent of these crimes based on the prism they're going through? Or do they know that they're pulling one over on everybody? Or are they looking at it completely different? Yeah, it's it's all about the, you know, the term is duping delight. It's mm-hmm. like I get a thrill out of pulling things over on people and fooling people and having this sense of power from doing that. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think in any way he's psychotic, which would mean he's so delusional he doesn't know what he did or he doesn't remember doing it. I don't think we see any evidence of that at all. But definitely it would be, I'm just smarter than everybody else, which is one of the things that is consistently said about Koberger by people that knew him. He always thought he was the smartest guy in the room mm-hmm. and liked to let people know that. So this would just be an extension of that. So when his co-burgers have been described, or his uh, lawyers rather, ha- have been describing him as calm and easy to speak with, what does that tell us about his mental state or personality by those, uh, by those ob- observations? Yeah, he's not psychotic. He's not hallucinating. He's not delusional. He's not ranting and raving. He's not highly emotional. You know, we mm-hmm. haven't seen anything at all that would... Um, you know, indicate he's out of control in any way. So I'm sure they find him to be kind of a model client. He's methodical. He's thoughtful. He, in all likelihood, has plans for how he's going to pursue his innocent plea here. And, um, you know, it's it all fits. I don't think we're going to be seeing much different from him as this moves forward. What's your take on the uh, parents being uh, uh, questioned uh, by a grand uh, in an in- uh, in a grand jury in Pennsylvania this last week. Uh, I know the police are saying that, that he is not connected to this. We have no evidence about it. But, I mean, what are the odds? You have the parents of a suspected serial killer being called into a grand jury for another murder. What would be the purpose of, of having them in there? Was it simply to exonerate him of that and put him at a place or time? Or what, what was the purpose of all that? Yeah, it certainly... As I understand it, it's um, they were subpoenaed to testify and, you know, a grand jury can compel people to testify, Mm -hmm. which is why if they wanted to question them, this might have been the best way to go about it. 
And it doesn't add up that it would involve anything other than the possible connection to another murder. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, the police have come out and said, oh, no, we have no evidence connecting him to this this disappearance of another woman in May of 2022, who was found dead last month. But there can't be any other reasonable explanation other than they're fishing for more information that could tie Coburger to the case or to another case, similar case. Would they be using it simply to try and, and, and talk to the parents about his behavior uh, at their home while he was there in more so relation to the Idaho murder case? And this was kind of the inroad to do it because it, they do have to have a, a reason of a possible crime being committed in that county for them to right. compel people right. to come in and testify. But then again, would that be some sort of a false pretense, though, as well, if you're bringing people in truly to question them about something else than what you're telling them you're coming in for? I don't even know what the rules would be for that or the legality. Yeah, I have no idea what the rules are for something like that. But it, it does seem sort of like a fishing expedition. But yeah. I guess it's something that's allowed if they have a, a good reason for, you know, a suspicion that it certainly would be done. So it no. makes, makes sense to me that it's all connected somehow. Uh, I, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the police don't necessarily need to tell anyone anything. And they, they can certainly say he has nothing to do with this right now. Exactly. Even if they yeah. do have stuff. On him. Even if they do, they they are not bound by any kind of journalism ethics to yeah. tell the rest of us what they're up to. Uh, Definitely. Very similar to the beginning of this, where they said they had no leads and they've been were trailing him for, for quite exactly. some time. So, yeah, exactly. Be interesting to see where that uh, kind of goes. Let's talk about his interest in studying the emotions and the influence and the psychological traits of criminals and criminal decision making, uh, you know, leading up to this, some of the studies that he was doing. Does that offer us some insight into his alleged actions uh, or does it just look really creepy? <laughs> Yeah, well, it sure looks creepy, doesn't it? And and I think there are, you know, 99% of the people who study criminology and are interested in the criminal mind are not themselves criminals. Now, I can't say 99% for sure. I don't have data to support sure. that. But the vast majority of people in a criminology class or criminology program are normal people. And for whatever reason, this is just an, an area of interest for them, a career interest. But there's a small percentage of people who do become fascinated with the criminal mind for all the wrong reasons. And in essence, you can say they want to meet people like themselves or they're learning how to become better criminals. And that's their goal. And they may find, you know, the stories of horrible crimes exciting, you know, so there's an emotional drive to study this stuff. And I think that's probably what we would see in this case is that he was always fascinated with the dark side of his own mind and really wants to learn how to get away with things. And that's interesting. I mean, look at all of the people who are find these sort of things exciting. I mean, it's pretty much why we have a show. <laughs> you know? Right. And right. I mean, there, 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 there's a, a huge facet of society that wants to understand it. Um, and try to you know solve that murder. We've always kind of been like that. Uh, with that being said, though, what is the tipping point? Is this something where deep down someone who who was able to commit a crime like this has been sitting there thinking about doing this homicidal type fantasies, if you will, for many, many years going back to when they first found interest in this? Or is this something where, Someone gets into this, they start studying it on a professional level in college academic courses and such, and then it, it raises their light bulb above their head saying, hmm, maybe I could do this just to see what it's like. Yeah, I think it's the, the former. I think that this is a person who had probably been having the thoughts and fantasies since adolescence, early adolescence even, and over time they evolved into more and more elaborate fantasies. And then, oh, well, here's an opportunity to study the criminal mind in college. Let's do that. And this is probably a person that's always been reading about criminals and mm -hmm. crime and murder and all these things. I think for most of us, it's a curious topic. It's foreign to us because it's so far from the way we go through the world. You know, we don't go through the world thinking about murder and rape and who we're going to hurt. It's just not the way we think. And by 
understanding this, it gives us a greater sense of having a, a sense of uh, power, if you want to say, how do we protect ourselves in the world? And, you know, we can overdo it and watch too much to the point we start to think the entire world is made up of, you know, serial killers, which is clearly um, distortion. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I I think that um, there's a, it's sort of a healthy interest versus a real unhealthy preoccupation. And I think for someone that commits a murder, it's it's the unhealthy preoccupation for all the wrong reasons. They're really not interested in making the world a better place and keeping their family safe. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. Siobhan Scott, thank you for that insight. We'd love to hear your thoughts on any of the cases we're following for you. 888-5-KILLER is our phone number. 888-5-KILLER. You can weigh in 24-7 on any of the cases that we're following for you right here. My name is Tony Bruschi. Stay with us. 